like every week when I stand before you, I want to encourage you. And this is one of those sermons that I hope will be encouraging. Because if you live long enough, you too will get old. So I know that's not probably our favorite topic of discussion when we look at God's Word, but it is the topic of discussion this morning. So I invite you to turn your iPhones and iPads to <laughs> uh, Genesis chapter 35. Genesis chapter 35. I entitled this message, for it's for all of us, so if you're younger and you're thinking, eh, this is for old people like in their 20s and it, it's uh, it's for you too young guys okay so you guys listen because there's there's a message in here concerning continuing continuing and this is what we're going to learn from Jacob those of you who are visiting with us we've been going through the book of Genesis and uh, we are looking at the life of Jacob now I always find it interesting that people think how can I be like Abraham or Isaac and, and Jacob and when you really investigate their lives, you think, wow, those guys are just like me. They struggle with this thing, walking with God. And they're really no different than any one of us. They're human who have been touched by the divine. And their life is changed. But yet often find themselves falling back on their own abilities their own guidance and direction for their lives. Well, you and I aren't much different than these great saints. These are individuals that God used yesteryear and will use today and in the future. Those of us who are willing just to simply continue to commit ourselves to the Lord and Him using us for His work and His purpose. In our passage this morning, we'll see that Jacob is coming to the end of his life. Although replete with many problems, it is the high point of his life journey. Could you imagine that? Especially as you're getting older. No, but this is not often the way seniors characterize the golden years of life. Nor young people are looking forward to those, those years. Much of our life is characterized and controlled by our difficult circumstances. Have you noticed that about your life? These things have more control over us than we should be, than how God should be controlling our lives. As senior adults, you know that the gleam in your eye is from the sun hitting your glasses. You feel like the night before and you haven't been anywhere. Your little black book contains only names ending in MD. You get winded playing chess. Your children look middle age. You finally reach the top of the ladder only to find that it was leaning against the wrong wall. You join a health club and you don't go. You decide to procrastinate but then you never get around to it. Your mind makes contracts your body can't meet. You know all the answers but nobody asks you the questions. You look forward to a dull evening. You walk with your head held high, trying to get used to your bifocals. Your favorite part of the newspaper is 25 years ago today. You sit in a rocking chair and can't get it going. Your knees buckle and your belt won't. You stop looking forward to your next birthday. Dialing long distance wears you out. You just can't stand people who are intolerant. The best part of your day is over when your alarm goes off. You burn the midnight oil after 9 p.m. Your back goes out more than you do. A fortune teller offers to read your face. And the little gray-haired lady you help across the street is your wife. You sink your teeth into a stake and they stay there. But one thing about getting old is that you can sing in a bathroom while you brush your teeth. <laughs> Old age 
can be the most rewarding period of life. For those who have found the satisfaction of a loving and close relationship with the Heavenly Father through faith in His Son. And the sunset years can be more appropriately labeled the golden years. Henry Durbinville felt this way. In his book, The Best is Yet to Be, he wrote this. I feel so sorry for folks who don't like to grow old. I revel in my years. They enrich me. I would not exchange the abiding rest of soul, the measure of wisdom I have gained from the sweet and bitter and perplexing experiences of life, nor the confirmed faith I now have in a loving God. For all the bright and uncertain hopes and tumultuous joys of youth, indeed I would not. These are the best years of my life. The way grows brighter, the birds sing sweeter, the wind blows softer, the sun shines more radiantly than ever before. I suppose my outward man is perishing, but my inward man is being joyously renewed day by day. Wow. How's that for looking at old age? Robertson McKilkin wrote, God planned the strength and beauty of youth to be physical, but the strength and beauty of age to be spiritual. We gradually lose the strength and beauty that is temporal, so we'll be sure to concentrate on the strength and beauty that is forever. That's a tremendous focus and a tremendous life lesson we need to learn. We can have an enjoyable and fruitful, fruitful conclusion to our life and a great impact on the future. This was Jacob's experience. He knew God existed and he knew him. It takes both. You need to know that God exists by faith. And if you seek him, he said he would reward those who do diligently seek him. He came to know God's special graces, enabling a transformation of the sunset years into glimmerings of eternal day. He continued to try to remain faithful to the Lord, and that's my challenge for each of you. Continue with the ability that God has given you to remain faithfully committed to the Lord. Let's look at the, the passage. In your outline that you have been given this morning, number one, as we look at the life of Jacob, learn these lessons. Number one, continue in your commitment to holiness. Continue in your commitment to holiness. Letter A. Remember, Satan works to defeat you. Look at chapter 34 that we looked at last week. You'll notice there's absolutely no reference to God. Did you make that observation? If not, it's now become obvious to you. There was no reference to God. Satan was powerfully at work in that chapter, just as he is powerfully at work around us. And it seems as if God has left the scene. You ever been there? Where you've been so attacked by the pressure of the things Satan has put into place that he's, man, it just seems like he's got a stranglehold on your flesh and controlling your life and it seems like God is so far away but notice what happens when chapter 35 the very first word it begins with God God said to Jacob get up go to Bethel and settle there that's pretty clear in direction build an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau God is still at work. Even in those dark moments of life, maintain that confidence knowing that God is at work. Letter B. Your work. You work to remove the offenses toward God. Notice what he does. He begins to tell his family what they need to do. So Jacob said to his family and all who were with him, get rid of the foreign gods. It's amazing. They're still here. Remember his wife took one of the foreign gods from her dad. 
Uh, and, and it seems like they, they've, they've grown. More and more of his family probably now have these idols about them. So he says, uh, purify yourselves and change your clothes. We must get up and go to Bethel. I will build an altar there to the God who answered me in my day of distress. He has been with me everywhere I have gone. Get rid of the idols. The first two commands God gives us in the Ten Commandments is number one, you'll have no other gods before me and make no idols or graven images of me. Nothing compares to me. And even your best effort, you're not going to find anything to replace me that will satisfy you like I will. And nothing you can design will even compare to me and my greatness. Put any other idea of what God is or who he is out of your mind and focus on him, who he truly is as he has revealed himself to us. But or see, know this, that God graciously does his work. God graciously does his work. As you commit yourself to, your, to holiness, being pure, focusing on God and Him alone, setting aside all other things that can take His place, you remove those things from your life, you can begin to see how God really does work in your life. And He does His work. Right in the midst of this challenging circumstances of traveling from Shechem all the way down to Bethel, there are numerous cities here in in the land of the Canaanites. And a lot of adversity. But God does this in verse 5. When they set out, a terror from God came over the cities. God began to his, do his work. Let him do his thing. He can do it. He can handle it far better than you can. Trust him. If he's given you direction, trust him to take you where he said he will. And where he's told you to go. And they did not pursue Jacob's son. So Jacob and all who were with him came to Luz, that is Bethel, in the land of Canaan. Jacob built an altar there and called it the place God of Bethel. He called the place the God of Bethel because it was there that God had revealed himself to him when he was fleeing from his brother. Now this is a tremendous growth point for Jacob. When Jacob first experienced the Lord at Bethel, he called it Bethel. And the word Bethel means God of place or the place of God. The place of God. He noticed that it was a place and it was called the place of God. And now he refers to it as the God of the place of God. You see the difference? He wasn't focused on the place now, but the God who was over that place whom he experienced there years before. You and I move in that same sort of direction as we grow closer to the Lord and more confident and dependent on Him. We move from the place of focusing on things, places, people, events, and we focus completely on Him. That is how we're to grow and to grow old in our relationship with the Lord. As many years as God gives us here to tarry, Continue to focus more and more on Him and dimmer the things of this world and brighter the things of God. Number two, continue your commitment to spiritual growth. How are we going to grow spiritually? Well, I think there's a very important lesson here in letter A. Celebrate your eternally changed life. When, when God comes into your life, when you come to the awareness that you are a sinner, you are separated from God, you begin to realize through the grace of God that you have a need for His forgiveness. You realize the only way you're going to be forgiven by God is to repent from your sin and trust Him in the forgiveness that He provided through Jesus Christ. And so as a result, you turn from your wicked ways and you trust by faith Christ, his life. He promised then that he would come and dwell within you. How long did he say he would dwell within you? Forever. Never leaving us. The eternal confidence that as a child of God, I am his now and for 
ever. We need to celebrate that. Yeah, as the, as the hair gets grayer, or instead of turning gray, it turns loose, you have that great confidence that you're still a child of God, will always be a child of God, and as a child of God, God will always take care of you. Even to what we would refer to often as the bitter end. He will take care of us. So celebrate your salvation. Look back to the time when God was moving in your life, drawing you to himself, and you responded to that goodness and trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. In verse 9, God appeared to Jacob again after he returned from Padanaram, and he blessed him. God said to him, your name is Jacob, and you will no longer be named Jacob, but your name will be Israel. He's just repeating what he told him earlier. You need that. Keep that mind sharp. Keep reminding yourself of this eternal gift God has given you. Salvation in Jesus Christ. He told him back in chapter 32, verse 28, that very thing, and he's repeating it again. And it was amazing how he continued to grow. I love that in verse 33. As his name was changed in chapter 33, verse 20, it tells us that he set up an altar and he called it God, the God of Israel. Me, the God of me. Previous to that point, he was calling God the God of Abraham. He referred to God as the fear of Isaac. And now he calls him the God of Israel. My God. My God. Letter B. Spiritual growth. There's future fruitfulness. Future fruitfulness is still attainable. You think, wow, I mean, I, as, as, a, as I get older, there's going to be a possibility for more fruit? Yes. I remember as a, a teen, young teenager working in the, uh, on my sister's grape farm. And I, I remember some of those brand new little suckers that would come out of the ground and, and, and new grape vines that would begin to form. And uh, then I remember going down to the older part of the, of the plantation and those large large grapevines they were huge and those things just continued to produce grapefruit and I want you to think of yourself as a mature vine that God has planted firmly in a confidence in him and that even in your twilight years and after them you can bear fruit, fruit that will last forever. God also said to him, listen, I, in verse 11, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation indeed, an assembly of nations will come from you, and kings will descend from you. That's a very strange thing to say to a man that's past his childbearing years, or his, her productive years. But realize this, that no matter what your condition is physically, God is still capable of using you through his power and his strength to accomplish fruitfulness in your life. Trust him. He will do it. Let her see. Persist feeding on the word of God. I, I, I cannot stress that enough. If we're going to continue to be fruitful, if we're going to continue to grow spiritually, then it's necessary for us to stay in the word of God. And God does that marvelously for Jacob. But in Jacob's case, he's face to face to him. It tells us in verse 12, I will give you the land that I gave to Abraham and Isaac. And I will give the land to your future descendants. Verse 13, then God withdrew from him at the place where he had spoken to him. Now, it, Jacob, Israel had that face-in-face -face encounter with God. We'll see later on that Joseph has encounters with God, but they're through dreams. You and I also have a different sort of way in which we encounter God. It's not a face-to-face -face experience, but it's through His Word. When we open up His revelation, we read what He has said to us through the Bible. He begins to speak to us. 
And we need to continue to allow him to speak to us. And as he speaks to us, that seed, that's nurturing, that's the ability to, to help us continue to stay strong spiritually so that we continue to bear fruit and make impact on lives around us. Second Corinthians says, Therefore, do not give up. Even though our outer person is being destroyed, our inner person is being renewed day by day. I didn't promise you that. I didn't write that. God did. He said, yes, physically you are going to... What is that? <laughs> yeah, you're going you're to keep failing. But spiritually, he said, you're going to be renewed day by day. For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. So do not focus on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Look what you see. I remember when my mom, we took a picture in, of her for her, uh, for her Skype. And she looked at her and said, wow, who's that old lady? Well, there's a beautiful lady on the inside because of Christ. And it's not what is seen that matters, it's what is unseen that matters. You are becoming more and more beautiful as a follower of Christ as you get older, walking with Him. For what is seen is temporal or temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Keep trying to cover up what's happening as you get older. You can't hide it, folks. You can't reverse it. But you can grow more and more spiritually, more and more beautiful on the inside. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, So we walk by faith, not by sight. Romans chapter 10, 17, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the words of Christ. That's what we need to do as Jacob had the privilege of experiencing and that was letting God speak to him. You and I have the same privilege as we feast on the word of God. It strengthens us inwardly so that we remain fruitful even in these golden years. Do you see what I'm saying? Remember God's faithfulness in the past. Number two, purify your life through repentance and faith continually and read and meditate and reflect on the Bible commit to God now the third thing continue in your commitment to the end because it's going to get here right the end is coming you will face your demise what does the end do for us letter A death prepares us for glorification death prepares us for glorification and you want, if you understand something about theology you realize that when you came to Christ you went through this thing called justification that means because of accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior, receiving Him as your Lord and Savior, you are now in the presence of God, justified, forgiven, in right relationship with Him. As you continue to grow on this earth as a faithful follower of Christ, it's called the process of sanctification, where God is shaping and molding us into the image and likeness of His Son. And then when the end comes, we move from the place of justified, sanctified, into this glorification where we are then in His presence forever and ever. And guess what it takes to get there? The door of death. You have to die. It's for each man to die once. And then comes judgment. We have to die. That's the door to heaven. So for you and me as Christians, this is a beautiful thing. Pardon? A commencement. A great way of expressing it. A commencement. Notice in verse 8. We find that Deborah, the one who had nursed and raised Rebecca, apparently she was with the family for over 150 years. She had a few wrinkles, but she certainly had a tremendous effect on the family. She died and was buried under the oak south of Bethel. So Jacob named the place Oak of Weeping. Apparently, Rebecca had perished. Deborah found her way to Jacob and caught up with him in the caravan and spent some time with him. And she continued to bless the family. And Jacob and his, his family. And now on the way, she dies. And he calls the place 
oak of weeping. And one thing you know about getting older, more and more of those close to you die off, don't they? Yeah, you lose more friends and family that were once with you, now gone. So let death be that opportunity, a welcomed opportunity of knowing that you're getting prepared for your own. Verse 16, when they set out from Bethel, they were still some distance from Ephrath, and Rachel began to give birth. And her labor was difficult. During her difficult labor, the midwife said to her, Don't be afraid, for you have another son. And with her last breath, she was dying. And she named him Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. Jacob set up a marker on her grave. It is the mark, marker of Rachel's grave to this day. Now, again, another death. This is the third death we're aware of in this passage in chapter 35. Verse 13, or I mean, uh, verse 20, 27. Jacob came to his father Isaac and Mamre in Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had stayed. Isaac lived 180 years. He took his last breath and died and was gathered to his people, old and full of days. His son Esau and Jacob buried him. So Deborah dies. Rachel dies, and his dad dies. And now, how is he looking at death? I think it's changed him. And I think it will you. How many young people thinking about death? I mean, you're, you're, even in your 30s and 40s, you're not thinking about death. You're still thinking about your career and your future and, and, and all the impact that you're going to have on people's lives. But man, when you get, you get past what? The old age of 50. You, you, your, your demise becomes more obvious as you see people around you dying. So just get used to it, folks. It's coming. If you haven't experienced it yet, you're going to be face to face with your own immortality. But embrace it. It's a beautiful thing for us to embrace. I mean, the, the church struggled with it. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, he, Paul said, We don't want you to be unaware, brothers, concerning those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve like the rest who have no hope. The, the Christian church was hoping that the kingdom of God in its fullness would come. And then all of a sudden, they're losing all of their fellow brothers and sisters in Christ and family members. And they're wondering, wait a minute, what's going on here? Isn't the kingdom supposed to come? Aren't we supposed to have this joyous family and reunion and, and usher in Jesus being sovereign over everything? And everybody's dying off. What's going on here? And he said, don't be concerned about those who die. Don't grieve like the world who has no hope. We have hope because there's life beyond this experience. And then he goes on to end that passage in verse 18. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Let's encourage each other with the fact that we're going to die. And death can be a beautiful thing. See, death is a bridge to life. Verse 8. Or verse 18. With her last breath, she was dying. And she named him ben and I. But her father called him Benjamin. Do you see, I think that's intentional. God did that intentionally. Someone was dying, and now someone's going to live. So dying ushers in life. It's a breath. It's a, it's a bridge to, to death. I mean, to, to heaven. Death is a bridge to heaven. Matter of fact, Revelation chapter 14, verse 13. The Spirit said this. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right. The dead who die in the Lord from now on are blessed, happy, to be congratulated. That's the word in the Greek. That is the way we are to look at death. Blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on, says the Spirit. They rest from their labor and their works fall with them. Make that impact. You are right now, as a senior, able to make an impact on people's lives for all eternity. And when you die, just like Jacob, what comes after you will continue to bear fruit. And one day you will have the privilege of being in glory and God showing your reward and you'll look around and see all the people's lives God impacted through you. And there's simple ways of doing. I love this one about the old boy and I mean, the little, old, little boy and the old man. Said the little boy, sometimes I drop my spoon. 
The old man said, I do too. The little boy whispered, I wet my pants. <laughs> I do too, laughed the old man. Said the little boy, I often cry. The old man nodded. So do I. But worst of all, said the boy, it seems grown-ups don't pay attention to me. And he felt the warmth of the wrinkled old hand. I know what you mean, said the little old man. You can make a huge impact on people's lives. Even in your golden years. See, death, let her see, does not end God's faithfulness. It continues. Verse 22, while Israel was living in the region, Reuben went and slept with his father's concubine, Bilhah. And Israel heard about it. Uh, you know, that's a, that's a, it doesn't even fit into this message right now. But just suffice to say, Reuben tries to take over control. That was one way of putting yourself in the place of leadership or prominence in a family, was to take your dad's concubine as, as your own. And he's going to pay a hefty price for that as we see later on as we go through the book. But then he lists all the sons of Jacob, his 12 sons. Was God faithful to those after Jacob? You better believe it. God remained faithful to Jacob's family. He's used that family over the years and most importantly, he used that family to usher in the Messiah, Jesus Christ. He blessed that family. Paul said it this way concerning blessings for I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time for my departure is close I have fought the good fight let that be said about you you fought the good fight right to the end I have finished the race I have kept the faith there is reserved for me in the future the crown of righteousness with the Lord the righteous judge will give me on that day and not only me but all of those who love his appearing can't wait to see him that's your attitude about this life i can't wait to be with jesus but until then i want to be a blessing to others always wherever we are in life our best days are still ahead fruitfulness will continue long after our departure may we be found growing faithfully in our commitment to the lord as he is continually faithful to us. You will be more and more like Christ as you continue faithful unto the Lord to the end. Because he will be much more faithful to you. Keep going. Keep going. Father.